Andrew Harvey and I are meeting here in Boulder on a beautiful day in order to celebrate the meaning and essence of Kundalini, a word that was not well known in our culture until a few generations back. Andrew has had deep experiences of this profound mystery, as have I. And of course, Andrew is the man to whom I'm most indebted in my life because he was able to recognize for me what was happening in this mysterious process when nobody else understood anything about it. More than that, he is my beloved friend. He changed my life forever. Without Andrew, I would not be sitting here uh, participating in this conversation. But we're going to have a conversation. And since Kundalini is known to stimulate the creative flow, we're going to begin by each reading a couple of poems from our new books. Andrew's got his new book right in his hand. I'm thrilled that it's now published and he's granted me the honor of receiving one of the first copies. It's called Turn Me to Gold, 108 Poems of Kabir. <laughs> yeah? I want to return your beautiful compliment to you <laughs> because when I first met you, I realized you were that rarest of things, a real mystic and that you'd been through an overwhelmingly beautiful and terrible experience, and that the poems that were being born from that experience were initiatory poems. And since that wonderful meeting so many years ago, you've gone on to pour out, out of the depths of the experience of your Kundalini transformation, a whole river of truly amazing poems. You haven't just poured out these poems. You've also been working with people who have gone through profound Kundalini experiences because you know the terrain. And you've also written two major books on the process of the Kundalini. The first book, which I had the honor to help you edit and introduce, mm -hmm. Unmasking the Rose. And then this second book, which is going to come out in spring after your next book, The Kundalini Poems, that talk about creativity, is a book in which I don't think anyone will, I don't think there is another book like the book that you're publishing in the spring, this book of very, very careful, very sober, very wise accounts of the different aspects of the Kundalini experience. So I want to say to you that without your witness of this process, without the clarity and the sobriety that you brought to this most devastating and amazing of processes, I myself would not have been able to make any deeper progress in the Kundalini experience because I've relied so much on your love, your companionship, your deep understanding of the enterprise that I have, and also your formulations, which are so helpful. So it's an honor for me to sit here with you, and it is an especial honor to read out these poems by Kabir, these two poems by someone who is a huge and everlasting beloved of both of our hearts, and someone whom we know went through the entire transfiguration experience. He was turned to gold mm -hmm. by the Kundalini, mm -hmm. and he's speaking out of that experience to us in these poems to give us the guts and the passion mm -hmm. and the discipline to allow this amazing transformation to happen to us. So here are two poems. The first one is about the ecstatic state that the Kundalini creates and about the transfiguration process that it activates. The second poem is about the blissful unified force field of direct perception of reality that the Kundalini graces her loving slaves with. Mm -hmm. So this is a complete overarching expression in the highest terms of everything that we will be unpacking okay. from one of the great, the two great universal mystical poets. I think with Rumi, he's one yeah. of the two 
who really can count as a universal voice. And he's coming back at this time to help us in this great transfiguration that is trying to take place. So here it is. Kabir drank in avidly the nectar of God's love. The well-baked pot will never again be turned on the potter's wheel. The wine of the beloved's love becomes more ravishing the more you drink it, but it is hard to buy, for the wine seller demands your head in exchange. Many throng around the wine merchant's stall. He drinks his fill who offers his head. The rest get turned away, dry and empty. You are truly drunk with the beloved's wine, whose bliss never changes. When you roam like a mad elephant, forgetful of yourself, the bliss-drunk elephant forfeits its usual grass, for the arrow of love burns within his heart. He's chained to the gate of love and throws dust on his own head. The drunken one is absorbed in one unknown. He has overcome desire, soared free of anxiety. Under the spell of love's wine, he transcends while in a body, the stage of liberation. The lake in which once not even a jug could be lowered, the love-mad elephant now bathes in with bliss. The temple has drowned along with its spire. Yet the birds go thirsty. Kabir exhausted many yogic alchemies, but found none like the Lord's love. If even one drop enters your body, your whole being turns to gold. If even one drop enters your body, your whole being turns to gold. No more precise description of the Kundalini, its effect and its goal could be found. Mm -hmm. And this is why I've chosen the second poem, because this poem, when I worked on it, reminded me so much of the poems that you've been writing, because they come from the same mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. All the universal poets share this placeless place from which they speak or rather are spoken through mm -hmm. and this poem is a poem of the unified force field of blissful perception that's born in heart mind soul and body when the kundalini truly begins to unify entire entire in golden being so this is for you dorothy Thank you. Into that music, my mind vanished. Absorbed in his feet, all grief dissolved. From the essence word, a chord, and on it the swan rises and soars free. On emptiness mountain, Symbols shimmer, nectar rains down, drops of love. Kabir says, seeker, listen, hear, each taste brings bliss. For me, that is a direct description of the Kundalini. The essence word, whichever essence word you choose, and for him it was the name of God, mm -hmm. or the sound of Om, mm -hmm. from that essence word, the swan rises on the cord of the whole nervous system and of the chakra system mm -hmm. and soars free, mm -hmm. embraces and merges with the emptiness, and then everything appears in its true divine fullness and emptiness and 
in that appearance is born the bliss of direct recognition of the God in you, of the God in reality. And thank that you, reads to your poems. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Andrew. Thank <laughs> this you, book thanks. turned That's me to go, please, please, yeah. plunge into it. It will yeah. change your life. It changed mine. I'm not the same person. It's gorgeous. And it's a very, very, very beautiful book because it has amazing photographs by a very brilliant young yeah. photographer that really show the sacred world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Beautiful. Mm. I'm going to read uh, two poems from a book that I had hoped would be published for tonight, <laughs> but it's still uh, pending. But it will be out uh, possibly in a, a few weeks. I'm sure it'll be out in a few weeks. And this book, uh, I just went ahead and called it the Kundalini Poems. You just said it. I just did it. That's the source, as Andrew has said. That's where it comes from. That's uh, what its meaning is. So I just called them the Kundalini Poems. And these poems arrived exactly as Andrew has described. They were not crafted by me. They were received by me. It was a very, for me, a very unusual experience. They came very rapidly. They were all written within the last uh, 18 months. They came at a poem a day, which is very unusual for poets. Uh, they sometimes came more than one a day. But all I, I was the scribe. All I had to do was write down what was given to me as a kind of transmission. So I will read you a couple of poems from this forthcoming volume. The first poem is called Seekers. Rumi tells us what you seek was seeking you. How is it that when I was looking for you, you were seeking me also? Silently, you watched and waited. Sometimes gave me a brief glimpse or taste of who you were, like a shy deer in the forest that vanishes when you turn to look. And so I roamed, looking here and there, gazing at the hieroglyphs on trees, or peering into the throats of flowers for secret revelations listening to the waves pounding the shore for messages, examining books and stars seeking essence. Hmm. Finally, I gave up my searching, surrendered my deep desire to stillness, and then you gave me a kiss that lasted forever. poem is called Kundalini, the life force, because Kundalini is the life force. What you must know is this. It will not come as a thought or a concept or an experiment in a laboratory. <laughs> it will not be an extension of all that has already been proved by wise men in tomes and bound volumes for centuries before. It will happen within what you call your body. You will not know where your flesh ends and a feeling comes that is both outside and inside a realization arriving as an experience, a happening that you have no words to describe. Of course, you can try. You can speak of it as rapture, as ecstasy, 
as a flowing field of bliss. But once it happens, you will recognize it as that which unites all and of which you are an indivisible part. Drop to ocean, cell to body, the nameless you to love. That is such a marvelously precise poem. Because what is absolutely amazing about an authentic Kundalini experience is that there is nothing in any literature, mm -mm. in any sacred text, mm -mm. in any teaching mm -mm. that you could ever possibly receive that prepares you for That's its right. outrageous power and magnificence. That's right. Nothing. 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 Right. Not even the greatest poems of Rumi or Kabir can begin to begin. Right. They just point to it, but they, until you've had the experience, you don't often know what they're talking That's about, right. simply because the experience itself is beyond any words. It's ineffable. It's <laughs> truly ineffable. Devastating, amazing, totally changes your understanding yeah. of reality. And there's a before and an after, isn't oh there? Oh my. The person that you were before the Kundalini eruption is a completely different person That's from right. the person you are afterwards. That's right. Because it goes beyond even the normal waking up of divine perception, which can be very subtle and very yeah. beautiful and can yeah. be described. Because what the Kundalini seems to me to be is the moment when the divine decides that it is time for you to enter into the stream of radical, concept-free, dogma-free mm -hmm. transfiguration of your mm -hmm. whole being. Mm -hmm. And when that moment comes, everything is transformed by it. That's right. Forever. The forever. kiss that lasts Absolutely. forever. Absolutely. And what you're brought into is the field of radical, churning, turbulent, amazing, bewildering transformation right. that is the real fast track. Yeah, and isn't that the case? It That's what you've case. been describing in your work. It is the case. And it can happen sometimes very quickly. It can happen sometimes after a slow progression of getting ready. But when it happens, it is indescribable. I mean, it, in my experience, and you're going to talk about your experience later, but I was thrown, I was catapulted in a few seconds from what we familiar consciousness into ecstatic consciousness. So, and I didn't even have a word for what happened to me. I had no word to describe it. In fact, somebody had to tell me, had to say, you have experienced ecstasy. And I said, oh, is that what it was? <laughs> and because I was just... It was so intense, and it, didn't, it wasn't just for a minute or for 10 minutes. It went on for day after day after. And finally, I lay on the floor, and I just said, Here I am, God, take me. No, it was overwhelming. There was a lot of preparation for it. You had studied. You had a very decent and honorable academic career. Yes. But when it came, I there was nothing that prepared you for it. Well, I had, I had barely heard of Kundalini. I knew there right. was such a thing. But I didn't know what it was. I didn't. I knew the words. I knew the myth. You know the ancient myth that there's a snake at the bottom of the spine, and when Kundalini awakens, the snake will rise through the chakras and it will come into your head, and it is as, as if a thousand petals, lotus petals, open. Well, what does that mean? It meant nothing to me, right. except that when it happened, and it was in a basically a split second, that force, that life force, that energy, that beauty, that ecstatic awareness shot in from my spine up into my head. And then it was indeed as if a thousand, thousand petals lotus lotus opened. Lotus. And yes. I realized why they say that. Yes. Because there are pulsations within the head, literally in your brain. Pulsation, pulsation, pulsation. 
And uh, that is a thousand petals opening. And each pulsation opens onto another revelation, which opens onto another revelation, oh, yeah. which opens onto another revelation. Yes. It's a, like a bark fugue, a mad forever. bark fugue, forever, forever and ever, ever and ever. And the Kundalini itself is very creative, because although this can go on for years, and it has for me in one form or another, um, it's always different. It plays, it's almost like it plays tricks on you. <laughs> it can come, now the general description has to do with coming up through the chakras one by one and preparing and after many years and excruciating. Uh, A ceases standing on your head in, and, yeah, in caves. Exactly. Mm. Then you might get a taste of this. But that is not true and even the way it happened for me was not true. I had what I think of as an overall and highly diffused experience of this. It just went everywhere. Yes. I guess you'd call it a full body orgasm. I don't know. And it does have an erotic tone. Oh, yes. But it is very different from sex per se. Yes. Very different. It is delightful. It's wonderful. It's sexy. But it's not a sexual at least for me, not what I would call a specifically sexual. I think of sex as something that has a a, 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 a cause, something that sets it off. It has a goal. This doesn't. It simply is. It it's just a perpetual is. state of flowering from within. Within. With erotic within. joy with erotic. towards all things. That's right. You fall in love with everything. Yes. Everyone and everything. Everyone is beautiful. The world is beautiful. And you are in a kind of paradise. Um, and although for some people... It can be an excruciating experience. I would have to say, although I had some challenges along the way, I was spared the worst of it, believe me. I was certainly spared the worst of it. I, uh, but the kundalini goes through your body, and this is true. It will, at least for me and many others I've spoken with, if you have blocks, if you have hang-ups, if you've got old issues that are not That's resolved, it. whether they're psychological or physical or what, it will find those weak spots, and it will push, and it will push, and it, and it, it will focus your attention on that problem, whatever it is. And finally, it will give way, and you think, oh, well, I got through that. Next thing you know, it's found another weak spot, and you have to go through another uh, challenge. But uh, ultimately, you do settle down. You do integrate. Let's speak about integration a little bit later, okay. Okay. because I think what we were wanting to do... Can I help you, darling? Are no, you looking no, that's for something? Right. That's right. I'm what we wanted to do was perhaps read out this conversation yes. that would give people a sense of the overall power of the Kundalini and uh -huh. its, its function in our world. Well, we're going to do a little, uh, I guess you'd say a psychodrama here. <laughs> <laughs> because years, some years ago... Andrew was teaching a workshop, and one of his students asked him about Kundalini. I thought the, his reply was brilliant. It sums up the entire process in a most uh, stunning way. So I kept the transcript of that exchange, and so we're going to read it to you now. I'm going to be the participant, and Andrew is going to play the one and only Andrew Harvey. <laughs> I'm going to try and play him. It's always difficult to play him, but I don't think I have a copy of it. Do you only have one copy of it? No, I, have, I brought you a copy. Isn't that it? Ah, voila. There you go. There you are. The okay. Kundalini has found the copy. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> she begins by saying, Andrew, I've watched your interview with someone on, t on the website. Oh, you did. I have that book. I've got it by my bedside. Oh, my goodness, have you read the book on the Kundalini? Do you love her poems? Do they speak to you? I'm talking about Dorothy, oh, of course. Okay. Well, when she's talking to you, to you, which is why I ordered this book, I also saw her website on Kundalini or the Unmasking the Rose book. Yes, and there's a very important book which sounds true brought out called Kundalini and Dorothy is the first essay in that and by far the most interesting. Right. Excellent. Thank you, Andrew. Well, can I ask you a question? Have you experienced directly the Kundalini rising in you? Well, yes, I have. 
and I've been doing work with Sally Kempton for a couple of years and with all the other teachers. It's been a very gentle process for me, but I know that for many people it's been quite disturbing. There was so much ignorance around it, and there's so much confusion about what's difficult and what's energetic and so on that I've come across. There's no difference. Yeah, go on. Well, the body is condensed, crystallized light energy, so energies are physical and the body is energy. Indeed. But some people can still have physical aches and pains and think that it's just physical and not energetic. And it might be coming from something they've eaten, <laughs> food or something. Unlikely in the Kundalini process, because as Dorothy explains, the Kundalini seems to work with, it opens up wholly new realms, and then it ruthlessly goes to those blockages of energy which are results of karmic or traumatic experience. So there can be very, very deep traumas hidden in the psychosomatic spiritual body, which then it works on, and that, of course, can manifest as illness or deep suffering. Which raises the question as to whether one should have a teacher when something is happening, or can we trust our own personal connection with the divine to actually work through these things? Or should we rush off to someone like Sally or you? Because it's more about... Well, I think there is an intermediary path. I don't think of myself as a guru. I hope I'm a friend, and I don't believe in the guru system. I think what you need for the evolutionary path is a sincere, passionate, knowledgeable practitioner who is also humble, who is also aware of what he or she doesn't know and can't know, and who models how to learn and keep learning. If you can find someone like that, and you could go to Dorothy directly, Dorothy's available for consultation. This is what she's doing in her 89th year. She's talking to people. She's sharing. She's loving. But she's not doing so as Madame Kundalini. She's doing so as a loving, tender friend. And I feel that is the most wonderful kind of companion for the journey. A wise, practiced friend, mentor who never lords it over you, but always is willing to share what they know and is deeply compassionate about your journey and holds that journey in deep reverence and respect. She, but she might be busy. She'd be thrilled to talk to you. Give her a ring. I think that what I'd love to do with that ringing in our ears is to describe to you the Kundalini experience that I had last year. Good. I'd and love I would to. love your deepest interpretation of it, because actually I've never spoken of it before. Oh, my so sure. this is a very, I feel very, very exposed honored. moment for me. Well, and I these, would love to these share These are it very with you. sacred and intimate and personal experiences. But if we can't speak about these things, who can? This I is know, what we've been I speaking know. as friends in late night well, telephone calls. I've been doing calls. it for years. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, after I finally got over 15 years of silence, you know, I was in silence. For 15 years, I had no guru, no teacher, no, no, no friend even to talk with. So, but that was many years back, and since then I've learned to speak. So, Andrew, I'm honored and well, darling, breathless. You know, we've spoken about the Kundalini many times, and I had a very dramatic initial touch in my 20s, mm -hmm. and then, of course, a series of visionary experiences yeah in the intervening decades, yes. which I knew had been activated by that initial uh -huh. Kundalini experience. But the really vast experience, and it has changed everything for me, happened last year. And I've never really described this to anybody, but I want to describe it to you. Yes. And I want to describe it to all of you because it's so important that we share these experiences, mm -hmm. particularly at this time, mm -hmm. because the Kundalini has a prophetic dimension as well as a transfiguring dimension. Mm -hmm. It baptizes you into the archetypal pattern of what's going on in our world. Exactly. And 
what happened to me was that I was in Boulder and I was working with my great friend Carolyn Baker on the book that we called Savage Grace, which is about the way in which our time is the dancing ground of Kali and that we're in a very late stage of Kali's dance and the need for transformation on every level is now not only urgent but absolutely essential if we're going to survive. Mm -hmm. And in this book we laid out what we believed and also the great jewel that's hidden in this extremity which is the jewel of non-dual realization. If you're not going to plunge into a deep mystical discipline to find out who you really are in this age, you'll never do it. You'll never do it. Yes. The great gift of such an extreme crisis is that it bitch slaps you awake and makes you aware that the only security you could ever possibly have is in the depth of your own knowledge of your deathlessness and the truth of the self. That is the only security and that's the only place from which you can go on pouring yourself out even when you know that the chances of anyone listening really or doing anything <laughs> are slim. <laughs> so that is the place it's which slim, all slim. beings who are awake need to get to and then gamble their lives away for God and trust in miracle. Okay. That was the book and it was a very... I'm very proud of the book, and Carolyn did an amazing job in writing it with me. But after finishing it, I really was worried that I had gone too far and that I'd been too ferocious in the book and that we'd been excessively fierce about the situation. And I really prayed to the mother to show me the truth, to tell me whether I was really aligned instead of reacting to my own suffering. And that night she said a, an overwhelming yes, which is the only time that I've ever felt her intervene to say, what you have said and written is real and people really need to get aligned with it. And it was huge because what happened, I was lying on my bed and I was about to go to sleep, I thought, and suddenly without any possible warning this electrifyingly ferocious white light just went up the whole length of my spine in a flame of vibrant power. I was ecstatic and then I was shown images of the mother including my ex-teacher and I said no to all of them because I knew she was doing it. I said, I want you in my heart. I don't want any images. I don't want even Mary. I don't want any names. I want you, you, you. And the images vanished. And in their place, I saw a, an infinite, boiling, ecstatic cauldron of monumental, thundering, wild, holy energy, all emerging from nothing. N a nothing boiling. And I knew that if I didn't stop the experience, and I knew I'd been, I was given the permission to stop the experience, that I would go straight into that nothing and be lost forever, and I would never come out of it. I know that I would never come out of it. And there was a temptation to go straight through the eye of that infinite storm into the fullness of the nothing. But I said no, and I returned. And as I said that no, she said, her voice rang out tenderly, and she said four words. She said, dear brother, be noble. Dear brother, be noble. And I woke up not just reeling from the experience, which was, as you know, something words just stammer before, but I woke up also reeling from those two instructions. Firstly, the whole of this last year has been a meditation on the first two words and the second two words. The first two words, dear brother, why would she call this ragged, crazy, Anglo-Indian, Buddhist, maniac, Hindu, whatever I am, why would the mother of all of the worlds call me her brother? 
And that is something so overwhelming. But it's something, I think, that goes to the heart of what the Kundalini does. Because what I have experienced in meditating on those first two words is that she treats all beings with infinite respect. And although she knows herself the source of all beings, all beings are given an exquisite dignity in and as themselves, as their own unique selves. And as I explored the word brother, I realized that as a sacred male, my task as a teacher, as a writer, as a mystical artist, is to be the brother of the mother, to turn up to protect and sustain and honor and deeply champion the mother, to be her brother, the most intimate and selfless companion to her, and to honor her as that, but also to honor her as myself, not as obliterated in her, but as someone who's been revealed in their full dignity to themselves by her and given that dignity by her. So it was a revolution in my understanding of what enlightenment can be, that it doesn't obliterate you, it reveals to you the vastness of your own authentic person and then calls you to the actions and the meditations and the deep service that belongs to that unique, huge, vast person that all of us essentially are. So we're all brothers and sisters of the mother. And then the second phrase was overwhelming for me. Be noble. And what does the word noble mean? It's not a word that... I love the word noble. It's the essence of everything that I truly believe in. My father loved that word. I come from a family that loved that word, a military family, a family that was deeply passionate about honor. And I've been passionate about nobility and honor in the work that I've done and in the kind of being I've tried to construct in myself. But I realized she was telling me something very profound about how to address the horror and madness and collapse and ghastly pain of our time. So for me, meditating on those two words has unfolded through her grace all kinds of realizations and revelations about how we need to be, how I need to be, and what I need to encourage other people tenderly to be, to rise to this great evolutionary challenge that we're in. And then, and this leads to the next part of our conversation about integration, because I'd like to share with you both the experiences that followed and the challenges of integration that this brotherly nobility that I've been compelled into through this vast experience has opened up. The first thing that happened was that I met in a great medieval mystic, Hadovich of Antwerp. She was a 13th century Beguine. I met poems that described this storm of energy arising out of the nothing that I'd met directly in the Kundalini. And reading these poems with the experience was a monumental ecstasy because I realized that the mother was giving me Hadovich directly as a way of interpreting this experience and guaranteeing it and solidifying it. And as I was reading her, she came into my being in the same way that Kabir came into my being five years ago. And I started to speak with her, sing with her, feel her in my flesh, this amazing transmission that happens in these realms between the great ones and the ones who are being reared and helped to grow. It's an extraordinary relationship. It goes beyond time and space. It's one of the great gifts of the Kundalini. I've had it with Rumi, I've had it Kabir, and now Hadovich came. And as I continue to plunge into her poems and into the worldview and into her letters, suddenly I was having very powerful, enormously transformative experiences of the nothing, the no-thing, the total emptiness, <coughs> the void behind all things. And that 
baptized me at a far deeper level than I've ever experienced in the grounded self, in the self, in the transcendent self that's also absolutely imminent. And until I had those sustained experience of no thing, I had still been veiled from some a great deal of the transcendent vastness of the true authentic divine self. But that has been through her grace continually opening in me. Then what followed are the trials and ordeals of what this vaster experience of the self was showing me in myself. And there were essentially three trials. There were the psychological trials. How would any system, even the one that you created out of mystical experience, hold up under the blast of that no thing? So it made me reconsider all of the formulations and concepts and secret dogmas and subtle dualisms that I'd ever, ever entertained. And I thought that they were wise and intelligent, but this, the no thing blasts language away, blasts concept away. So that was the first monumental and ravishing ordeal, actually, to want to burn everything and to start completely afresh because of the vastness of what had been opened. The second was a tremendous desire arose in me to experience that level of rapture with another human being. And I realized as this desire arose that this has been one of the guiding illusions of my life. This has been something that has dragged me into suffering again and again and again. And that this time I must not pursue it with an individual but allow the love to suffuse everything. But what that meant is that I had to crucify my desire for the human beloved yeah. and finally see it as the damaging fantasy it has been. For me, not for yeah. others. Mm -hmm. And what that prepared me for was a revelation of my beloved cat as my destined beloved. I've been looking for the beloved in all the wrong places, and there she was, sitting on my bed. And I realized this in a moment of ecstasy, which I'm sure was the grace of the mother. I've been looking for the beloved. Here is the beloved. She's leading me into a wholly new relationship with the whole of life and with my body and, and opening up vast vistas of tenderness that I'd never experienced before. So that was the second ordeal and the second revelation. And the third ordeal that followed was that my body started to reveal all of the ways in which I'd been tormenting it and driving it too hard. Mm -hmm. And I was experienced great pain in my legs, great pain in my stomach, great fatigue. Mm -hmm. And instead of being intimidated by that, I realized that what she was saying to me is that you cannot possibly go on doing mm -hmm. what you've been doing in the way that you've been doing. You've had to do it that way. You've had to pour yourself out with the whole of yourself. Mm -hmm. Because you were, that was the mission then. But the mission now is to live the kind of subtle, receptive life that will allow this to become settled and much more resplendent in me than it is at the moment. So I just wanted to offer that experience and the, those three levels of ordeal and ask you for what, what you feel when you hear that. Well, I feel that I'm very, very, very honored, Andrew. This is a most profound experience, and indeed, it is. It takes a bit of effort to share it publicly. Yes. Uh, many people c cannot bear to t even to tell their best friend what is going on, but I agree wholly with what you said. This is the time when we must speak. I have another friend who said, at this time in history, we must be teachers to one another. Exactly. How do we do that? By sharing our experience. Everyone is unique. Everyone has a different experience. Absolutely. Yours is unique. I've never heard anything exactly like what you have described. But 
It's wonderful. It's beautiful. Um, Doesn't she work with unique attention to the unique needs and the unique yeah. actions and missions of each unique being? Exactly. It doesn't have a it's, formula or a No, concept. there is no formula. There is no set pattern. It doesn't follow this, this, this. It doesn't go from the root chakra to the next chakra to the next chakra. No. No. It's, it, it does as it will with you. And uh, it's, it's quite wonderful. It's marvelous, and I loved what you said about not seeking to have this love focused entirely on another human being. And I think that that's a very wise perception that you've come to. For me, uh, it happened in a different way. I was like you. I was looking for this uh, kind of connection with another human being. Well, after I got my heart broken over and over and over, <laughs> I know this I, experience. <laughs> you know about yes. that. And finally, I decided, no, that's not the way. I'm not going to do this anymore. Fortunately, I have reached the age where these concerns are no longer very. But it, it goes very deep what you're saying because once the Kundalini has done her amazing work, uh -huh. she has announced that the beloved lives within. The beloved within. That's yes. that's my beloved. Yes. I call her the beloved within. Yes. And to me, every visitation that we have of rapture or love or ecstasy or whatever or insight, whatever it is, that's the beloved within. Yes. And there is a beloved within. Of course. And and uh, what I feel is that we of co of course are too small. We could never ever in a million years begin to grasp the whole of the source, the reality of oh, God. We Not, would die at the first we, glimpse of it. It's die. so vast and powerful. Yeah. Yes. It's sort of like it's been, for our benefit, stepped down enough oh, yes. that we experience this sweet, beautiful, indescribable ecstasy. But that's the connection. I think in yes. those moments we are connected to the divine source. We are connected We're a light all. drop of this infinite ocean of exactly. pulsing light. That's right. Made of the same substance. But, but, tiny, tiny, but tiny, tiny but everything at the same time. Nothing and everything. That's right. But we can only be the everything if we truly experience the nothing. Well, I think that's true. And that's what is being opened up by the Kundalini, this mm -hmm. immense paradox. It's a great paradox because <clears throat> what I experienced in the moment of awakening, and I know that others have I've read about this, others too, is that Basically, we are nothing. We are nothing. We do not exist. We are a fantasy that we created to tell ourselves. But ultimately, the only thing that's real is this vast, indescribable uh, energy. This source. energy is what's real. That's the right. bliss energy emerging from the light, creating a yes. billion, billion different combinations. Yes. That's the only reality. That's the reality. And that's the reality that you experience directly in the Kundalini, through I the think, Kundalini. I think so. Yes. In a much stepped down form, thank yes. goodness. Yes. Thank goodness. Because as you said, we, you know the stories of, well, who was it in Greek mythology? It's a uh, simile, I guess, who wanted to see Zeus in all of his glory. And he had promised her to grant her wish, whatever it was. Well, he came to her in all of his glory, and she turned to ash in a minute. Yes. In an instant, she went, she f melted into ash. So we don't, we're not we don't we're not asking for that, but we're asking for something else. And this force, this indescribable force, this reality, this energy, whatever it is, however you want to call it, it goes on and on and on for the rest of your life. And I'm testament to that. I celebrated my 90th birthday <laughs> last March of all things, of all things, which seems unreal. But I still, not certainly at the intensity or the frequency at the beginning, but I still get enough glimpses to know that it's still there. It's a, it's a process of endlessly more subtle refinement and attunement. Precisely. Let's go back a little bit, okay. because I mentioned those three ordeals, yes. the, the mental ordeal yes. of being confronted with the majesty of the nothing, which rubbles your words. Oh, well, the and emotional ordeal yeah. of really looking at this vision of the beloved and realizing yeah. I had to interiorize, and then the, the ordeal of realizing I had to change my whole attitude to my well, body. And what I would interject And what has here. happened to you in your, in your 
these ordeals of integration? What have been your well? What I learned early on, on was that even though we had these magnificent and brilliant openings, if we have unfinished business, we have to go back and deal with that, right. including the psychological issues, things that we've kind of pasted over right. and, and not wanted to deal with and not wanted to think about. But it will suddenly be right in your face, and you will face it, and you will relive it, and you will learn what the essence, what the lesson is. There's a lesson for you, and you will learn what that is. And I did. I went right to the bottom of mine, and I realized for the first time why I'd been happy, unhappy all of my childhood, <laughs> you know, because it's very simple uh, that, that many of us are like that. We're deprived of love when we're children, and that can make us very inter introverted and lonely and afraid. And addicted to love, as we both were. You're looking. You're looking. The addiction is yeah. caused by the depth of the loneliness and the so. abandonment, I isn't it? I think so. And it you can think you're going to get that exactly. from another human being. Right. And you will for a time. Yes. But it may not go on forever. No. Anyway, that's one thing I learned. But it, the process of integration never, never stops. But you also had physical complexities. Come well, on, Dorothy. You had really difficult well, things to go through. You have, What about your eyesight? Well, what I was going the... to say, yes, of course, right. but not at the level that some people have. I know people who just practically died right. from how things went awry with their kundalini, how they were not prepared, how they are maybe still suffering in a terrible way. And although I had challenges, yes, one of my challenges was eyesight because one of the commonest symptoms, negative symptoms of kundalini is eye pressure. Yes. And when you have that eye pressure, it becomes very difficult even to read. I was trying to be a teacher and read student papers. I couldn't bear to look at a text. So that was one of my challenges, and then there were others. And I remember I would think when something would happen, maybe it would be my stomach, maybe it would be my heart, thinking, oh, well, I got through that one, but this one I don't know about. <laughs> I may not make it. <laughs> but gradually those things did smooth out, and my life became gentler and quieter and smoother. And uh, the, the energies have become so soft and so gentle and so tender, and it's just at a very minimal level of, of the intensity that it wasn't, but it's still... Fabulous. And I will mention this because I think I'm still astonished. One of the practices that I do now sometimes, not always, is so simple. Nobody could imitate it. I couldn't have done it early on. All I do is stand there and move my hands yes. around my body. And I move them ah, farther and farther away from my body. And I feel the sweetest, indescribable, ineffable soft, gentle energies that you can imagine. Well, what am I doing? I think I'm feeling the aura. Yes. I think I'm feeling my own aura. But how You're many You're caressing your subtle body, in a sense. It's exactly what yes. it is. But how many people do you know who do that? I didn't know that I well, could do that. Well, maybe we'll find out that there are all kinds of people doing this well, from this be, conversation because so. we're trying to open up that possibility maybe of so. exchange. But I couldn't have done that at the beginning. It was, like you said, like a wild storm of feeling. Right. It was, it was intense. It was almost more than you could take. But I love what you're saying because one of the things, one of the great gifts of the Kundalini is, as you said, creativity, mm -hmm. but it's also that you become so creative in your own practice. Uh -huh. You don't follow necessarily the old rules or do oh, it absolutely. 99 ways or oh, 99 times or no. stand on your head in the way that the no. yoga teacher tells you to. No. You work with her you in allow you directly. It to do you. Yes. You don't do it. You allow it to do you. Yes. And I think it's very sad that, for example, a lot of the teachers now, particularly the Tai Chi teachers, right. their emphasis is on getting the form right. You have to do it this way. You have to do it that way to get the form right. They don't seem to know anything about the inner reactions or the inner life that's going on. 
This is tragic in the yoga community in also. In yoga also. Here this great discipline that is intended to help you unify your whole being okay. with God is being made into a superior form of athletics that's oh, supposed terrible. to make you sexy. It's and terrible. It's a negation of the reality. Uh, and, of and it's a misunderstanding and it's corruption yes. and it's a commercialization and a bastardization. Yes. And people, and they just don't even know what, what they're talking about. But my question is, particularly with Qigong and, and yoga, who taught the first teachers? Where did they learn these forms? They learned it actually from the animals from and the, the trees, from nature. Well, I that think, is what I believe. Well, that's one thing, and it's possible. But that's I why think, yoga has so many animal poses. That's true. Yeah. But also, what I think is this: I think as their bodies became infinitely more sensitive and more subtle. If they did a simple gesture like this, they felt rupture right. flow in their hands, right. in, their, in their arms. The first time I ever tried to do kundalini, and this was at the very beginning, I had heard of something called yoga, which was very strange, and I was very suspicious of. But I decided I'd give it a shot. I sat on the floor, I took my arm, and I raised it up like this, and I felt rapture flow all the way up my arm. Mm. And then I raised my other hand, and I felt rapture flow up. And I thought, no wonder people do yoga. It's so easy. Anybody can do it. It's wonderful. <laughs> you now, put I all would... those technicians out of their jobs if they said things like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, of course, I, I don't do that now. I can't do that now. That was the state of consciousness I was in. But... Um, it's an amazing and beautiful experience. I feel very, I feel so blessed because it transformed my life. And of course, I was six, about fifty-three when it had. And that's a wonderful time. That's when you begin to just simply repeat whatever you've done before and think the same thoughts. And you know, you were with, saved from that. And, you and were it, saved from was, a respectable older age. That's right. You were saved that's from right. being. A nice, sweet little old lady I who potters about and you become it, Madame Kundalini. Except that it's still a secret. And what is, funny, <laughs> what, is fun, what is fun to me is that most people see me and what they see is this nice, sweet little old lady. <laughs> but you're in great disguise. It's a wonderful that's disguise. That's a wonderful that disguise. That you've done. Exactly. That's my disguise. And I don't try to share it with those people because they wouldn't get it. But what I find is that you're so overjoyed when you find a like-minded soul on a similar path, not the same path. But you see, one of the gifts, transmissions of insight that I was given at the very first was that when this starts, you will be alone on your path. And I was basically all alone for 15 years till I met you. And But as time goes on, you'll meet a few people. That's it. Who will understand. But ultimately, this will increase exponentially and it will be everywhere and I think this is what you believe about the Kundalini phenomenon that's what's happening now yes because I think it is it is the field has been established and more and more people are tuning in to authentic Kundalini awakening and this has a tremendous meaning for our time doesn't it I think oh, this yeah. is at the center of your work what is the meaning of this huge outburst of Kundalini. And you know that it's huge because you've been running Kundalini Splendor. You've been receiving emails from people all over the world. You've been speaking to people all over the world who are going through this experience. Yeah. You know that it's happening on a monumental scale. Absolutely. What's the meaning of this? Well, you? what you know, it's the it's they talk about the evolution of consciousness, the the evolution of, of human uh, of humanity. This is the next stage of our evolution. I'm convinced we are literally turning into a different creature. We We're are, mutating. We are mutating. It's not always easy. Are you kidding? <laughs> because, because you don't jump from A to B all at once. You go through stages and you may go forward and you may go back and you may have good days and bad days and good times and bad times. But this transmutation is taking place in our bodies and it, it is happening. And I like to say, it makes fun thing infinitely more sensitive in all kinds of ways. Absolutely. And I sometimes say, I have done this practice so long and gone through all these changes, and I've achieved the state where I can no longer function as a human in this world. <laughs> <laughs> But that's not true. You function very, well, very I, clearly. You have to world. learn to walk in the two worlds. Oh, yes. You have to be in the, quote, what they call the real world, yes. which, of course, is the unreal world, and then also 
keep your connection yes. to this other spiritual, invisible, the invisible world. You know, Rumi talks about how there is a world inside the world. Well, I wouldn't call this world unreal. I think what it is is a manifestation, an epiphany. No, I'm talking of, about ordinary life. Yes, oh day yes. Day-to-day life. Oh yes. That life, you know. But what do you think is the is really going on? Let me let me yeah, propose something. Why don't you, you? Why don't you speak? I feel that the crisis that we're in is the birth canal potentially of a new embodied divine Absolutely. humanity. Absolutely. All the old structures are being destroyed, right? Including the old structures of how you become enlightened and what enlightenment oh, yeah. is. Oh, yeah. What she's trying to show us is mm. that we need to be connected with the primordial mother energy that that's creates right. everything. That's right. And that's the basis of the evolution of the new. Yeah. What she's also showing us is that it isn't in some transcendent going off into the light that this experience becomes most potent. Mm -hmm. It becomes most potent when the plug of our whole being is put into the socket of her <laughs> naked electricity. Well put. Because what that does is start the embodiment process at a much deeper level of oh, truth yeah. and intensity. Oh, yeah. And this embodiment process is something that the patriarchal mystical traditions have been very scared of. Mm -hmm. Because it means a sacralization of the body, yeah. a redemption of sexuality, yeah. a transformation of All our of dissociation into total reverence for every cell of our being. Mm -hmm. And this is a revolution. Oh, and yeah. I think that she's got so fed up with the old transmission systems and their fla, 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 and their Oops. endless pontification and their over-precision which hasn't resulted in a transformed humanity, mm -hmm. that she's decided, let them go on talking, let them go on playing in the dust. What I'm going to do is I'm going to intervene directly and I'm going to give well, people that's directly that's this happened. amazing initiation so that they can come into a naked, intimate relationship with me uniquely Beautiful. and be shaped Beautiful. into divine hooray, hooray, Does that hooray. make sense to you? It makes total sense. And what I... I think of, you know, in the Sri Lanka, you've got the interlocking uh, triangles. And what you've got going on now is two processes, interlocked, but quite different. You've got, on the outside, the structures are absolutely collapsing. Exactly. Exactly. They're crumbling and they're falling apart. But on the inside, there is a rebirth and a rebuilding. It's all going on at the same time. It's amazing how the, this... The disaster is happening and the birth is happening exactly. at the same time. Yeah. But the birth is an embodied birth. That's it's right. It's the birth of the divine in the human, in the cells of the body, absolutely. in everything. And what a shock it was to find that out. Well, <laughs> especially if you were a scholar of all the ancient mystical traditions in which hardly any talk of the body wasn't... Well, Repressive try, and try agonized. To, try going to graduate school in English. There was no body. It was never discussed. Right. It didn't exist. I said, as I, I had a wonderful experience uh, studying the great wisdom tradition of the West, but basically I was living from here up right. in my head. And it was a shock to get into my body and realize, oh, this is what they mean when they talk about unconditional love or, or whatever. You know, it was a shock. But even if you have a pretty advanced mystical experience, most people who've had what they would call an awakening experience are actually living from the heart center up. Probably. But with this dead and the body untransfigured oh, no. by being penetrated by the light, no. this will never result in a new species. This is just a tinkering with the old. The Kundalini has to come in directly nakedly from her as an act of supreme evolutionary grace to jumpstart and jump start. activate jump start. this penetration of the light of everything in us I and agree. the bringing of all of us into mysterious unity with the one. Perfect. Does that make deep it, sense to totally. you? Is that your experience, your living experience? Yes, it is. Now, it is true that as we get older and our hormones die down, that this whole transformative experience does become much more subtle. Yes. It's not as obvious, it's not as conspicuous, but it's still the same. 
Well, and, 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 and one would not wish to return to those earlier stages because you have to be pretty strong and young and active to withstand a lot of what comes to, through your body. Absolutely, but on the other hand, isn't it, and perhaps this is the last thing we should say in this wonderful conversation, but the full body orgasmic bliss is an astounding initiation, which is unforgettable. Oh, yes. But the subtler it becomes, the more secretly astonishing yeah. it becomes. Oh, yes. Because you realize slowly that the self is omnipresent and always present. Mm -hmm. And that steady, tender, peaceful relationship with the self is a far vaster relationship than anything that even the wildest ecstasy can produce because it is both drunken and sober. Mm -hmm. And that combination of the ecstatic within, but also the peace that surrounds and embraces it, mm -hmm. really begins to teach you what it is to be an embodied divine I self. Agree. And brings you, has brought me so much closer to the really great teachers that I recognize as enlightened, such as mm -hmm. Ramana Maharshi, for yes. example. Oh, yes. I can see, I've always loved him, but after this experience and during this last year, I can see now that he is living in that great subtle peace that is yeah. actually the last stage which is why peace that passes all understanding is always emphasized as the final flowering yeah. the last gift yeah. the kiss that is so gentle mm -hmm. before the union after death yes <laughs> I don't know what to say but yes yes does yes. that ring true for where of you're traveling of course of course it feels totally true this is the real path. This is the real experience. This is the authentic process. And I, again, I just feel it's such a blessing to have been allowed to participate in this. And particularly, I will claim the designation as a pioneer because, I, because at the time that this happened for me, there was nothing. Kundalini basically was not known in the Western world. And uh, I didn't know anybody had ever heard of it. Didn't even know the word. So, but now, uh, even though a lot of the teaching is false and spurious, at least it's in the it's in the vocabulary. At least it's in the consciousness. I mean, now Kundalini has practically become a buzzword. But that's why conversations but like this are the, important yes. because the danger of it becoming a buzzword is that people think that they're familiar with the Kundalini. Exactly. You're not familiar with the Kundalini. You'll never be familiar with the Kundalini. If you've ever even gone anywhere near the Kundalini, you'll realize that this is the ultimate and most terrifying and amazing mystery of all, and that better not name it than pretend to understand it. Correct. So there's good and there's also bad happening with this uh, spread, this dim dis dissemination of thoughts of what people think is Kundalini. Well, I, th I think it's even more than that. I think that that's certainly true, but I think that one of the advantages, and I think this is true for you, of having been a pioneer, we both have been pioneers yes. and paid for it. That's it's right. been agony and ecstasy. Yeah, agony but and one ecstasy. of the wonderful things you learn as a pioneer and are forced to learn is precision because you don't have anyone to rely on. That's right. You have the light to rely on, you have your inmost experience to rely on, and you have the testimony of the great pioneers of the past. Mm -hmm. So you have to make clear each step as far as you can through grace for yourself. And that gives a tremendous understanding over time of the different stages and the ways in which they work, which then allows you to help other people. Yeah. And you come to understand just how essential it is to keep receptive, to keep tenderly disciplined, to keep inspired, yeah, to keep constantly turning up. And that is what enables you and I at this stage of our lives to turn to the people who are experiencing this and says, it is amazing, but these are the kinds of difficulties, these are the kinds of challenges, and this is what you're going to need for your journey. That's true. It can't be done any other way, can Oh, it? I know. I agree. I agree. But, you know, we have so many people still who have these uh, uh, transformative experiences that are very disconcerting to them. 
And I still hear from people who say, I have no one to talk to. I can't tell my, uh, my family. I can't tell my friends. They would think I'm crazy. Tell me, am I crazy? And one of my functions is simply to say, no, you're not crazy. You're going through your evolution of yourself, of your consciousness. You are not crazy because this is happening all over. I'm sure you're familiar with R Rupert Sheldrake's work on the, establishing the field, which makes a whole lot more sense now uh, in terms of Kundalini than it might have all those many years ago. But I think he's right. You establish the field and then it becomes much easier for others to participate. And I hope easier for them to go through the process. I, I don't know about that. It may still be just as hard as it ever was. But they'll have companions. But at least it, they're not alone. Exactly. They're not alone. You are not alone. And, and, you know, when I had my experience, there was no Internet. There were two or three books, and I could name them. That's about all I had. I had Gopi Krishna, I had The Serpent Power, and I had a book by Lee Sinella, which in which he'd collected some stories of Kundalini Awakening. That was just about all there was. There was no Internet. When the Internet came along, a friend of mine who was sort of an advanced technician was playing with it and said, what do you want me to put in? I said, put in the word kundalini. He did, and there were four references. You put in that word now, and there are thousands of references. Thousands. I don't, it's bewildering. I don't know how people would ever choose. I think it's more confusing than anything. But it's, it's all over the place in some form or another. So, darling, in these last moments, just bless everybody who's listening and... Open your heart and give some last words to people to encourage them on this great well, evolutionary journey that we're all on at this moment. So painful and so amazing and okay. so necessary. Well, my blessing to people would be, don't be afraid of this process. It is part of the natural pro progression. It is being scripted elsewhere. You don't have to make it up. It's being done mm. to and for you and all of us. And my total vision is a worldwide initiation. I think planetary initiation. I, it sounds impossible, but wasn't it impossible that a woman, an English teacher in Wichita, Kansas, would have this massive awakening out of the blue? You know, if that can happen, I say anything can happen. We don't know. There's a wild card. There's often a wild card, something we hadn't expected or predicted. But that can happen, and welcome to the process. But we are a club of brothers and sisters, and we can help each other along the way. That's, so bless you all. Bless you all. I love you. Love is the key. Love is the answer, and love is the reality of it all. You know that very simple saying, God is love. That's true. That's all you need. So you, you say a blessing now. That's it. That's enough.